You are now watching part one of what will be a two-part presentation on the psychology of learning. In this part, I will discuss classical conditioning, and in an, in an upcoming presentation, I will discuss operant conditioning. In any introductory psychology textbook, it seems that one of the more confusing chapters, possibly because it has so many moving parts, is the chapter on learning. In classical conditioning, it can be tricky to keep straight in any given example which bit of the scenario is the conditioned stimulus, the unconditioned stimulus, the conditioned response, and the unconditioned response. And then in operant conditioning, otherwise known as instrumental conditioning, you not only need to distinguish between examples of reinforcement and punishment, but you have the additional challenge that either one of those things can be positive or negative. For many students, this seems counterintuitive. I mean, what on earth is negative reinforcement? We think of reinforcement as being reward, right? Or what is po positive punishment, for that matter? So, over my years of teaching psychology, I found it was worth my while to put some extra thought into the subject of classical and operant conditioning and try to figure out if there was anything I could do to make those topics a little more straightforward. Because what often happens is this. Students, when they're in class, will believe they have a handle on this area of psychology. But when it comes time to show what you know on a quiz or exam, questions about conditioning are the ones students seem most likely to answer incorrectly. What I'd like to do first is present you with a definition of classical conditioning. Next, I will review two early experiments in classical conditioning, the Pavlov's dog experiment and the little Albert experiment. Finally, I will suggest a process that you might use if you need to de determine whether a part of a classical conditioning example is the unconditioned stimulus, the unconditioned response, the conditioned stimulus, or the conditioned response. So our definition of classical conditioning is that it is a basic form of learning in which a stimulus that produces an innate response becomes associated with the neutral stimulus, which acquires the power to elicit the same response. So as I said, I was going to go over these two classic studies. The first study is Pavlov's dog experiment. And actually, Pavlov was a physiologist, and he wasn't really interested in studying conditioning. He hadn't even thought of the term yet, but he was studying the digestive system of dogs. And he knew that dogs salivated automatically when food was placed in their mouths, and he was trying to study these, uh, this byproduct, the salivation of uh, that dogs responded to food, so he put uh, attached tubes to their salivary ducts and was able to collect the saliva every time he presented food. However, uh, there was a problem. At least it started out to be a problem until Pavlov realized he discovered something new. But what he discovered is dogs would drool just when they saw food. They drooled when they saw the dish the food was placed in. Uh, or heard the footsteps of the assistant who was bringing the food. And uh, Pavlov called these psychic secretions, and he tried to eliminate the problem by sneaking up on the dogs without warning. But he eventually discovered that he had found or stumbled upon a really bas basic form of learning, which we call classical conditioning. And that's what Pavlov devoted the rest of his life to studying. So before conditioning, we have an unconditioned stimulus, which is the food, which automatically causes the unconditioned response, which is drooling or salivation. And the neutral stimulus, if you ring the bell, the dog doesn't respond. The dog might perk his ears up, uh, but there's no salivation response. During conditioning, the bell comes right before the food. So it's bell and then food. And the dog is salivating in response to the food. So unconditioned stimulus is leading to the unconditioned response. But after many pairings, the neutral stimulus, the bell, had actually become a conditioned stimulus. Because all Pavlov needed to do was ring the bell, and he could elicit, draw out that response of drooling. So the bell had become a conditioned stimulus, and drooling in response to the bell 
is a conditioned response. Next we have the Little Albert experiment. This first experiment was on non-human animals. Pavlov was studying dogs. Uh, John Watson and his uh, research assistant, uh, Rosalie Rayner, wanted to study whether a, an emotional reaction could be taught or conditioned. When you look at the big questions in psychology, uh, one of them is nature versus nurture, otherwise known as heredity versus environment. And Watson very much believed that environmental experiences, learning experiences, the nurture aspect were most important and he believed he could teach a child to be fearful even a child like 11 month old Albert uh, that was a, a pseudonym his name, the child's name wasn't actually Albert but he was born to a woman who was a wet nurse at a hospital and wet nurses at that time had a very low status um, they got work nursing other people's babies and um, it's speculated maybe that's why uh, the mother didn't object to this experiment that her son was being subjected to, which was kind of traumatic. Uh, they were teaching him, uh, Watson and Rayner were teaching Albert to be afraid of something. So like most uh, infant children, uh, Albert was afraid of loud noises. That's a very typical fear of uh, lo fear of loud noises. Also, loss of support. If you're holding a baby and then your arms drop, you seem to lose your grip. Uh, they will react to that. They fear loss of support. Uh, but this fear of loud noises was something that could be used in this experiment. So uh, Watson showed Albert the rat. The rat was neutral. It did not cause the fear response. Watson made a loud noise by hitting a hammer against a metal bar, and that did cause the fear response. So the loud noise was an unconditioned stimulus, and crying, the fear reaction to the loud noise, is, is an unconditioned response. During conditioning, Albert would see the rat right before hearing the loud noise. And early on, the crying, the fear response, was fear of the loud noise. But eventually, all Albert needed to do was to see the rat, previously a neutral stimulus, and Albert would cry. So the rat was now a conditioned stimulus, and crying, being afraid of the rat, trying to get away, was a conditioned response. Now for the approach or process I think you might find helpful when sorting out cla examples of classical conditioning. First, I'd like to break down classical conditioning by suggesting that you approach any example you encounter on a worksheet, quiz, or test by telling yourself that you have two decisions to make, or two questions to answer. The first one is, is this thing a stimulus or is it a response? And the second question is, is it conditioned or is it unconditioned? So starting with the first question, is this a stimulus or a response? One way you might think of a stimulus is it is something that you or any person or animal experience. It stimulates one of your senses. In Pavlov's experiment, food is presented and it stimulates the dog's sense of sight and smell. The food is a stimulus. The bell, which the dog hears, is another stimulus. In the little Albert experiment, the white rat with the child, which the child sees is a stimulus and so is the loud noise which the child hears. A response is something you do automatically when the stimulus is presented. You might think of it as a reaction to the stimulus. The dog salivates in response to the food. Little Albert cries in response to the loud noise. Salivating, startling, and crying are responses. The second question we need to ask is, is this thing conditioned or is it unconditioned? You might think of conditioned as meaning something like learned. In Pavlov's experiment, the bell is a conditioned stimulus because the dog has to learn to respond to it. The first time the dog hears the bell, the dog does not salivate. At that point in time, the bell is still a neutral stimulus, not capable of eliciting, 
drawing out or causing the response of the salivation. The food, on the other hand, is the unconditioned stimulus, which automatically elicits the salivation response before any sort of training has taken place. In the Little Albert experiment, the loud noise was unconditioned. It caused an automatic reflexive response the very first time Albert heard it. And since we decided earlier that a noise or sound is a stimulus, we can now say that this is an unconditioned stimulus. The reaction to that stimulus is also unconditioned. It didn't need to be learned. So Albert startles and cries upon hearing the loud noise. That's an unconditioned response. The rat, on the other hand, did not cause an automatic fear response the first time Albert saw it. So at that time, upon first meeting of boy and rat, the rat was a neutral stimulus. But after repeated pairings with the loud noise, the rat was no longer neutral. A strong association between the rat and the scary noise had been formed. And therefore Albert learned, in a sense, that rat equals bad news. In classical conditioning terms, the rat had become a conditioned stimulus, and the learned response, fear, when Albert saw the rat, had become a conditioned response. I hope this has been helpful in your understanding of the parts of classical conditioning, and uh, as soon as possible, I'm going to follow up with a presentation on operant conditioning including what is the meaning of positive and negative reinforcement and positive and negative punishment. Thank you for listening.